This building may not be very familiar to you, but I'm sure that the magazines we make inside are. This is the home of Future Publishing, Europe's biggest publisher of computers magazines. My name's Steve Jarrett, and I'm the editor of one of those magazines, perhaps the best known of all, Amiga Format. Before we get down to business, perhaps you'd like to take a look inside. These are the offices of the biggest, best, and most famous Amiga magazine, Amiga Format. And here are a few of the people that worked long and hard to bring you the most read Amiga magazine on the newsstands. Behind me is Sue White, Amiga Format's art editor. She's responsible for making sure the magazine looks as good as it does. This is Richard Jones. He's our production editor. He reads everything we write, takes out all the spelling mistakes, and makes sure it's fit to print. And this is Nick Veach, consultant editor and Amiga Format's resident technical expert. Anyway, let's leave them to get on with their work. Let's go to my desk. Multimedia is a very strange world where text, graphics, music and video combine in a feast for the senses. But what does it all mean for you and how can you create your own multimedia masterpieces on your machine? This video aims to show you the software available for the Amiga, how it's used by the experts and the results they achieve. Now, over to our own multimedia expert. I hope you find this tutorial useful and interesting. Hello, and welcome to the Amiga Format Guide to Multimedia. The word multimedia could mean any number of things to you, so perhaps before we get into any detail, we should explain what multimedia is. The idea behind multimedia is, since computers have got more sophisticated in the last 10 years or so, to allow the user to interact with text, graphics, animation and sound in a way which requires very little training or knowledge about computers. This means that computers running this sort of application can be used in all sorts of situations by untrained personnel opening up the way for unattended information points, hotel information channels, and various other applications. Although multimedia engine is a term often used to describe computers with a CD-ROM drive, it is not necessary to have a CD-ROM drive to be able to do multimedia type things. It's more of a concept rather than a particular feature of any hardware or software. The reason that CD machines are often touted as being the right sort of thing is because all this sound and animated video takes up quite a bit of room and a CD can store over 630 megabytes of data. But really, all you need is a computer and the right software. The Amiga is an ideal machine to start with because it's both cheap and very versatile. Even a primitive Amiga 1200 can be used to control all sorts of devices, from tape decks to CD drives and laser displays. So it isn't really a wonder that there are so many different software packages dedicated to it. Don't really worry about an exact definition for multimedia. No one else can come up with one either not even at the giant multimedia show organised annually in London. Right, so now we've got that straight, why would anyone want to use a multimedia system? Well, quite a few people should. A properly authored multimedia programme will act like a miniature operating system allowing the user to explore areas of data with little or no knowledge of the processes involved. They will just click the mouse or even touch the screen on the objects that interest them. This sort of thing is ideal for information points in hotels, tourist centres, railway stations or museums and can also be used for home reference work such as atlases or encyclopedias. A system like this can also be used to run training programmes. Most learning is just watching and listening. The computer can do that as well as any teacher. In fact, in many cases it can be better, because the student can go over any section they don't understand again and again until they do, without holding everyone else back. Imagine an estate agent's window with a multimedia system inside. Through a touch plate on the window, anyone could look at house details, see pictures of the interior, enter information, apply for an appointment, the works, without ever having to speak to anyone or wasting any paper, or indeed having to speak to any nasty estate agent. So what sort of software could we use to create such applications on the Amiga? Well, thanks to the Amiga being a cheap and popular machine, there are quite a few pieces of software written for it. Packages such as Scala, MediaPoint, Hyperbook, and CanDo, which was given away on the cover disc of Amiga format back in issue 36. In a moment, we'll take a look at one of these packages, Helm, and see how we go about creating a multimedia application of our own. But first, let's recap on what we know so far, which is...
Before we start looking at our own application, perhaps it would be useful to take a look at someone else's. Let's have a look at one of these discs here, the Hutchinson's Encyclopedia. This is quite an old disc, and it was originally designed to run on the CDTV. If you've never heard of the CDTV, don't worry, not many people did, which is why Commodore didn't sell very many of them. OK, this is an encyclopedia, which means that you must be able to easily navigate backwards and forwards. Let's see how they manage that. Well, as you can see, the first screen is simple enough. It will do a title search, let you look at just pictures, display a full index, and down the bottom we have help and info. All I have to do is select one of these boxes by placing the red square over it. Then we click the button, and off we go. This has taken us to a list of titles. I actually want an entry on Hoover, that American bloke who had the dam built. To get to his entry, I'll just start spelling out his name. You have to remember, this title was designed to run on a machine which had no keyboard. So I'm having to select these letters with the controller, which isn't always easy. Once we're close to the name, we can just pick out one from the list and click on the button. Up should come a page of text. Right, if we want more text, we can continue with the arrow in the uh, bottom right-hand corner. Otherwise, we can even select uh, pictures. And if I click there, the pictures should come up now. What a fine figure of a man he is. OK, well, you get the general idea. Instead of pictures, we could watch associated animations, listen to music, or whatever. We've seen what can be done, and it all looks very simple, doesn't it? All you have to do is create icons on the screen and have them do something, like call up a sound or a picture, or another page of icon. OK, so you have an idea for a multimedia application, and you know roughly what's expected of it. How would you go about it? This piece of software I'm loading up now is called Helm, and it is probably more than capable of creating most applications you have thought up. Before you even get to the point of starting up your software, though, you should make a plan. If you went through the rigors of computer studies at school, I know just what you're thinking now. I never needed a flowchart when I was designing programs at school, and I'm not going to start now. Unfortunately, this is the wrong approach. Multimedia applications, at least the good ones, are not very linear in nature. They don't flow from one part of the program to the next in a predetermined sequence. This makes them very difficult to plan in your head. As most multimedia presentations consist of pages of information, it is better to think of the plan as a kind of map, like in an adventure game. You should map out your application into screens, drawing links between them where appropriate. OK, I don't know what application you want to produce, but I'm fairly keen on producing a nice address book. Where's the multimedia element in that? Well, we'll just see, shall we? The software I'm going to be using now is called Helm. Essentially, it allows you to create objects on screen and associate actions to them. I'm now selecting an item box, which we'll use to hold all the names in our address book. Just by dragging out the box, a requester style panel is created. This one isn't terribly useful at the moment, because it doesn't actually contain any information. In order to enter some data, I'll double click on the box. The window now displayed shows all the current settings. You can configure the box in many different ways, but for the moment, all we want to do is change the type of box. Selecting type brings up a different list, and now we can select the type of requester we want. I think that we want a scrolling list. There it is. I can also add an item to this list below, just by selecting this menu. And my first entry will be Sue. OK, and if I click on this box here, it will give us buttons on the main screen so we can add and delete items without having to come back into this editor all the time. But while I'm here, I'll just tidy up the ones that we've got and uh, add another one. This name might be familiar to you. And now we'll go back to the main screen. You'll see that the add and delete buttons have appeared, and the people are in the list. Unfortunately, at the, at the moment, clicking on them won't do anything, because we haven't told the system what to do yet. OK, now from the menu, we'll select a new page. 
this is the page that we'll use to describe anything about the uh, entry that we've made on the, on the previous page, address or, or telephone or pictures or, or whatever we want. Uh, I'll just make a text box, which we can put address data in. Obviously, I haven't got anything in there at the moment. And now I'll create a picture box as well. Now, I already have a picture of, of Sue, who's the first entry on the list. I'll load it in now. There it is. Now, as it loads in, it, it looks like she's suffering from severe radiation burns. That's because the, the palette on the picture doesn't exactly match the palette we've got on the page. Fortunately, I should be able to remap the picture palette so that it more or less looks like a person. Right. Well, obviously, I could uh, type in all the, all the text here, but I won't bore you with that. There's one more important thing we should have on this page, though, and that's a button so we can return to the main menu. If I put this button in here and double-click on it, we go into the edit again. Now, you can adjust the buttons in any way you want. There, there are all sorts of effects for shadows, and borders, different different types of borders. They're all controlled by the software, so you don't have to have any drawing skills of yourself. Um, you should probably have a name for that as well. Just in general, type in a name. Now, th this button doesn't actually do anything yet, so to select it and choose action from the menu actions. All right, the, the action we want it to do is a, is a go to. So we'll just put that up there. And here's a list of all the places we could go. Uh, we want to go back to the first page, which is that one there. Now if I slip back into browse mode, we can test that it works. There we go. Because Helm, and indeed most other authoring systems, support AREX and AmigaDOS commands, it is really easy to make the system do anything you like. For instance, you may have noticed that there was no option to display a JPEG picture. But if I have a normal AmigaDOS utility, such as VT, I can simply pass instructions through to AmigaDOS to run that program, and then return to Helm when I'm done. This is another reason why the Amiga is such a great choice for multimedia applications. Because of AREX, the bundled macro language, and Amiga DOS itself, the entire Amiga operating system is really a multimedia application in itself. Well, that seemed to work OK, but there's one more link I have to make. I've created a page for Sue, but I haven't yet told Helm to go to that page when I select her from the list. To do that, I'll select the editing tool again, double Clicking on the requester will now bring up the type window. And from the same menu that I added items to this list, I can also assign actions to them. The action we want is a go to. And we want to go to the page which I happen to know is page 20. So I'll enter that here. And go back to the main screen. Now, hopefully, back in browse mode, when I click on Sue, We'll go straight to her page. And also clicking on return should take us back to the main page. Hurrah! That worked pretty well, didn't it? Obviously, you can create more pages for each person on the list. I recommend taking a bit more time over working out your presentation and doing it nicely. I'm not the world's neatest person, after all. I hope you saw how easy it was to create buttons and assign actions to them. That is all there is to multimedia applications because the action you could assign can be anything from playing music to showing animations or whatever. For example, in our address book, we could have added telephone numbers and assigned an action to them to play the numbers as frequency modulated tones. This would mean that all you would have to do is press the button and the Amiga will dial the number for you. Now that's what I call useful technology. If there's one thing I get tired of at Amiga Format, it's pressing buttons all the time. Anyway, your final application has as much multimedia-type stuff in it as you want it to, really. 
Most of the authoring packages allow you to play audio samples, animations, anything you can think of. I could have had an animated sequence of Sue eating a bar of chocolate in that window if I'd really wanted to. The only other important thing to mention is that obviously to include sound samples and animations, you will have had to create them or have them created for you. This means you might want to get hold of some extra hardware, such as a sound sampler or a digitizer. Remember, the Amiga has quite a lively PD scene, so you can always pick up lots of material from there if you need it, including soundtracks. OK then, let's have another recap. While we're on the subject of source material, remember that you can always shoot your own videos and digitize them, which allows me to make a shameless plug for another title in this series, the Amiga Format Guide to Desktop Video. Also, if you have issue 61, you'll see an offer for some copyright-free music on CD, an invaluable source of background sounds. OK, that's the plugs over with, but before you put your checkbook away, remember that all this data can take up a lot of room. If you haven't already got a hard drive fitted to your Amiga, now's the time to start thinking about buying one. Now let's take a look at some real applications and how they're put together. This CD was produced by a pioneering company called Optonica, who've worked on many multimedia systems. It contains several demonstrations of an authoring package called Interplay at Work. These are all real applications generated on the Amiga, and some of them are actually in use. The first one we'll look at is a tourist information application developed for people lost in Milton Keynes. This is the sort of information system which would run in a small, unattended kiosk, and would be similar to information points at large shows, hotels, and that sort of thing. Well, the opening is pretty good. There are two choices here. Let's pretend I'm completely lost and I want to find out where I am. Milton Keynes is strategically placed between London, which is approximately 50 miles due south, and Birmingham, which is 65 miles due north. It is directly beside the M1 on junctions 13 and 14. It is also on the Intercity Railway line from Euston to Birmingham, Manchester and Glasgow. The Milton Keynes Railway Station is very accessible, being no more than a mile from the city centre. Milton Keynes is England's newest city, which is forever expanding. Strictly speaking, it cannot actually be classed as a city, since it does not have a cathedral. However, the town of Milton Keynes was affectionately termed one when it was designated in 1967. The city was designed to achieve all the most desirable aims of any city, with a combination of homes, workplaces, shops, leisure and cultural facilities, set in a clean and peaceful environment. The result being an increase in population of more than 140,000 since 1965. Well, that showed a couple of different techniques, using wipes between shots while at the same time playing an audio soundtrack. You don't have to have an animation to keep people interested. As long as you have something going on most of the time, it doesn't get tedious or dull. In many ways, this is quite similar to video production. OK then, let's find out what we can do in Milton Keynes. All I have to do is press this button and we'll find out what I can do. There is always something happening in Milton Keynes. Whatever your interest may cover, there is somewhere you can pursue it. Here is a small selection of the facilities available. To choose one, please select a box. Well, I quite fancy finding out what the places of interest are. Whenever people think of Milton Keynes, they usually visualise an ever-expanding city with modern architecture and a clean environment. However, on closer inspection, there is ample evidence of tradition and history. One such place is Bradwell Village, which has a wonderful past for you to discover.
please select the destination you wish to enter. Well, this windmill sounds pretty interesting. Let's take a look at that. Bradwell Windmill is actually situated in the recreation grounds of Bradville. It is one of the few remaining windmills in England which is still in working order. This attractive tower mill was built in 1816 using the familiar building material limestone. Okay, I'm going to stop it the there. The cap is shaped... The sound breakup was due to the fact this disc was obviously produced for the CDTV, which wasn't quite as advanced as the CD-ROM drives of today. Well, that was pretty good. Did you notice the animation sequence that was playing there? Of course you did. That was a digitised sequence stored in a format known as CDXL. This format was originally devised for the CDTV we mentioned before, but it is equally useful for the CD32 or any other Amiga CD format. The animation is small enough that it can play in real time direct from the CD drive. That application was a little linear. Let's take a look at one now that you can dive in and out of. The education one should be good. OK, as far as I remember, this one is all about the senses. And I think I'd like to see something on the ear. It's quite a nice diagram. I can select any part of the ear I like. And I think I'll... Have a look at those funny bits in the middle. The ossicles consist of a group of bones called the malleus and stapes, which amplify the vibrations from the eardrum. OK, now let's see what happens when you click on view. For humans, sound serves as an important source of additional information, supplementing sight greatly. This sound... <coughs> is identified as a creature, but until we see the correct image, we cannot be sure. Well, that was an excellent example of an educational application. It was very open plan. You could access different levels, and it was pretty much left up to the user as to what he or she should do next. Optonica have also included a sequence of themselves on the disc. Let's take a look at some of that. Optonica is situated in the heart of rural England, in a Grade 2 listed building on the south side of Leicester, and enjoying excellent communications access via the local M1, M6 and M69 motorways. Company directors Lee Gibson and Kevin Stevens have been dedicated to the emerging multimedia industry for some years, and they have continued to be excited by the endless possibilities for the medium. Optonica's dedicated production and development personnel have many collective years' experience in the field of multimedia development and production, a young and friendly team working together to produce the best in multimedia. It is the synergy of both production and software development which gives Optonica its strength and diversity. The production department is provided with custom production tools by the software development department. In return, the development department can see how authoring tools perform in the real world on live multimedia data, allowing them to be honed for maximum operability. Optonica is probably the oldest and largest multimedia production house in Europe, working specifically with Amiga and CDTV development, and has expertise in production for both consumer and professional markets. And good on them too. That CD was put together with a package called Interplay. There are many other authoring systems available, and I'm sure we'll be doing another roundup soon in Amiga format. However, you should check out issue 57, which had a small feature covering some of this ground and had reviews of MediaPoint and Video Stage Pro. Now let's go for another recap. If you are serious about multimedia, you should think about CDs. You could store all the information you would ever need on a huge hard drive. In fact, 
Hard drives are now made in capacities of up to 3 gigabytes. That's 3,000 megabytes. And drives of capacities between 600 megabytes and 1 gigabyte are becoming quite common. The drawback, and there always is one, is that drives that big cost big money. A 1 gigabyte drive will cost you about 800 or 900 pounds. The advantage of the CD is that it can easily store large volumes of data at a reasonable price. If you were to produce in bulk, say around 1,000, they would cost you about one pound each in your Earth money. CDs are also very useful sources of public domain software and demos, including music and animations. With this, like the Aminet CD, the Fred Fish collection on CD-ROM, and the rather excellent series of discs from Almathera. This is one of Almathera's discs, and it's all about fractals. As well as being entertaining in itself, it is also a useful source of animation and stills. The fractal generation software included on this disc means that if you don't like the fractals included, you can always make your own. We begin our journey with a view of the whole Mandelbrot set. The box shows us the area we will magnify for the next picture. At greater magnification, we can see greater detail than before. We will place our box on an apparently insignificant three-way junction. On magnification, we see that there are several miniature copies of the Mandelbrot set dotted around. There are, in fact, an infinite number of these miniature copies, each of them slightly different. We carry on and zoom into the center of the junction. Again, we see more miniature Mandelbrots, which, although tiny, are as complex as the entire set. Each of these small Mandelbrots is connected by thin filaments. Let's have a closer look at one of these miniatures. Note that this Mandelbrot is pointing in a different direction to the main set. In again, deeper and deeper to view the heart of this Mandelbrot. Our magnification is so great now that we are losing definition and accuracy. We can redefine the accuracy by setting a higher number of iterations. Now the inside of our miniature Mandelbrot is clearer, but it will be clearer still if we change the colours. That's better. We can now make out the detail of the small Mandelbrot without difficulty. Well, we've just about come to the end of our tour of multimedia on the Amiga. I hope this video has given you something to think about. Remember, you can always get up to date on the latest software in the multimedia scene by reading Amiga format. I'll leave you with a look at some more multimedia applications. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you again soon.
We've produced this series of videos as part of our commitment to you, our readers. If you have any suggestions on how we should improve the videos or the magazine itself, please write to me, Steve Jarrett, at the address at the end of this video. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you again soon. Additional videos in the Amiga format range include Personal Paint, an introduction to the A1200, A1200 hard drives, upgrading your machine, Music X, Multimedia, Desktop Video Volume 1, Desktop Video Volume 2, and finally the Amiga format guide to Clarissa. Priced at just $14.99 each, or any three for $34.95, they represent excellent value for money. For further details, contact BVG at the address given at the end of this video.